I've entitled this lecture, Helen Keller, Modern Woman. Uh, but one of the most important things that I've realized, having worked for so long with all this material, is that we still somehow don't really understand her fully. She still remains an enigma to many of us. So um, the perception of Helen is um, one of usually an old lady or a little girl at the yeah. water pump. And I really <laughs> want to try and sort of dissuade everyone and make everyone understand that Helen was way beyond all of those things. And what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to do a quick overview using images um, from the collection so as we can have a general sense of her and her life before I really get into it. This is Helen's mother, Kate Keller. Helen was born in 1880 in Tuscumbia, Alabama. She was the daughter of a formerly wealthy Southern white family. Her mother's fam family was originally from the Northeast. Um, Kate Keller was extremely intelligent and very well educated, and she had the wherewithal to help her daughter, and I think that was very important. Um, Kate was 20 years younger than her husband, who was Captain Arthur Keller. He was a former captain in the Confederate Army. Helen became deaf and blind at 19 months. It remains unclear what caused her to become blind, but it's thought that she contracted either scarlet fever or rubella. And here is little Helen. So she's probably either six or seven years of age, given that she was born in 1880. Um, she was privileged. I think that's important to know that about Helen. Um, her privilege, she was so, so much so that Kate Keller could find help for her daughter. And she did so by um, contacting, first of all, an oculist and um, an optometrist, and who then put the Keller family in touch with Alexander Graham Bell. Alexander Bell, this is him here, and that is Helen, and that's Annie, and that's Bell's assistant, John Hitz. As many of you probably already know, Alexander Graham Bell was um, very busy and very influential in the field of, of the deaf. So um, he, what he did is he put um, the Keller family in touch with the Perkins School for the Blind. And there, um, the director of Perkins was a man called Michael Anagnos. And Anagnos sent along his leading student and graduate, who was a woman called Annie Sullivan. Many of you probably know Annie Sullivan, and um, Annie's success with Helen is now legendary, and so is Ted too, is Helen's fame. Um, Helen's extraordinary achievement at the water pump at so young an age drew huge media attention. What many people ask me when I sort of did dummy runs of this um, rehearsal, of this um, lecture, was how did Helen become famous? So I'm going to address that right now before I get into the lecture. Um, I think it was partly because the world was a much smaller place and Helen's renown reached the media much more quickly. A journalist appeared at Helen's doorstep in Tuscumbia, Alabama. But also, Annie was a, a phenomenal teacher in the sense that she knew how to get attention for her pupil. And also, the director of Perkins School for the Blind, Michael Anagnos, was very keen for good um, publicity for his school. And he pushed um, knowledge of Helen in not only they had, obviously, annual um, reports, but the world was so much smaller, and Boston, where Perkins was, was a huge center of philanthropy. So um, Annie fostered those connections with philanthropists to help Helen, and that sort of um, engendered a huge interest in Helen. Helen was famous from the age of eight until she died at the age of 87. She was friends with the most famous people of her day. So I'm gonna run through just a few just so as you have a sense of that. So here we have Mark Twain, we have Lawrence Hutton, who was a um, preeminent newspaper man. We have Annie in the back, and we have Helen. Then we have Herbert Hoover, President <laughs> Herbert Hoover, and this is at the White House, the World Conference of Workers for the Blind, 1931. So you have sort of a panoply of the most important people in the blindness world at that time. You have Robert Irwin, who was mm. huge for AFB. He was the sort of manager, make sure it all worked well at AFB. Um, you had Annie Sullivan, you had Helen, Herbert Hoover, Mrs. Hoover. You have a huge array, and I think that gentleman actually is from um, the RNIB, um, the Royal National Institute for the Blind. So, and then we have Helen with George Bernard Shaw and Lady Astor, 1932. 
We have Helen with Dwight Eisenhower, 1953. And we have Helen with Martha Graham, 1954. And we have Helen with JFK in 1961. She knew everybody. And the difficulty, I think, is to separate her iconic status from her being a normal woman. That's the problem. She was not a saint. And that's what I, more and more, over the years, I've tried over the 10 years, more and more now, to make it clear that she was a normal woman. But a normal woman can achieve so much. She was not this extraordinary mythic character. Admittedly, she was smarter than most of us, and she was more energetic than most of us, and she was extraordinary, but she was still a regular woman. In fact, that's what, you know, you'll, hopefully you'll get that from the end of this lecture. So what I also want you to see is Helen in action. It's very hard for us to imagine how she functioned on, on a daily level. So let me see, here's a film clip of Helen in Australia in 1948. Out of her own darkness, she has brought light and hope and courage to tens of thousands of afflicted people. Hers has been a magnificent life of service to humanity. Cinesound is privileged to present the first sound newsreel interview Miss Keller has given anywhere. Her words are often unintelligible, but her secretary, Miss Polly Thompson, interprets them. She is welcomed by Mr. Justice Maxwell, president of the Industrial Blind Institution. Miss Keller, Miss Thompson, nothing that I can say can convey to you the pride as well as the joy that we experience in welcoming you to Australia. Ms. And uh, people are always interested in knowing how I communicate with Miss Keller. Well, I spell it to her hand. That is one method. I use the manual alphabet. It is a... Uh, I spell out every letter of every word. I don't abbreviate at all. And then also, Helen can read my lips by placing her hand and with the second finger on the nose, she gets the nasal sounds, the M and N sounds. Uh, uh, mathematics. Mathematics. November. November. Sydney Harbour. Sydney Harbour. I thought I'd catch her. So that is Helen in action, okay? But what I also want to show to you is the way our perception of Helen, our mis uh, misconception of Helen. So first of all, we have Helen in The Miracle Worker, which most of you probably know. This is the movie with Anne Bancroft and Patty Duke. And this scene is where um, Annie is trying to get Helen to use her spoon instead of her fingers to eat food and not grab it from people's plates. She wants Helen to sit at the table, and this is what ensues. So, but this is obviously Helen as the benign old lady. She's very beautiful, which obviously only enhances our idea of a sort of saintly figure, but she was not benign, not, not by a long <laughs> shot. So, here, this is me in the archival vault with my kids, the young visitors to AFB. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use, as I said, many of the items in the archive um, to try and ex show Helen as a woman made of real flesh and blood. Um, Helen witnessed and was part of enormous social, cultural, and political changes in America. Um, I'm going to provide a definition of a modern woman. In the Western Hemisphere, it might be defined as a woman who is granted and enjoys equal opportunity in society to earn a salary and live on an equal social footing as a man. This right that so many of us take for granted 
has a relatively short history, and Helen Keller was very much part of that history. I'm going to focus on um, five areas of her life, education, politics, women's rights, change, the changing perception of blindness, and her personal life um, slash public persona. Um, her eloquence only increases the difficulty we have in seeing her as a real person with foibles and anxieties, um, just like the rest of us. Many of her people seem to think of her as a sort of optimistic lady. She wasn't always optimistic, she was very real. But this is, a, I'm gonna use many quotes through the lecture, and this is one of them, it's classic Helen. I really care for nothing in the world but liberty in all the departments of life. Liberty to grow mentally and spiritually, untrammeled by tradition and arbitrary standards. That was 1928. So we'll start with education. This is Annie Sullivan and Helen, circa 1893. Education was absolutely pivotal to Helen's success. Uh, there were two key women in Helen's infancy. Um, it, very important in bringing knowledge to Helen, those were her mother, Kate Keller, as I've mentioned before, and her teacher, Annie Sullivan. Annie was born in Massachusetts. She was the first generation of poor Irish immigrants. Her mother died of TB when she was nine. Um, Annie de um, developed trachoma when she was seven years of age, and she remained legally blind until she was 15. Um, she had multiple operations in her lifetime, but her eyesight always remained extremely poor. And I think what's interesting, she actually uh, did not focus on that. She absolutely focused on her pupil. She, she really hid, to some extent, her own disability, which is very interesting given um, her own psychology. Um, from the age of 10 to 14, Annie was in the Tewkesbury Arms house. Annie's father could not take care of her, her or her brother, Jimmy. And the two of them were basically sent to the arms house and left there. Jimmy died three months after their arrival. Um, Annie was traumatized throughout much of her life. And in fact, what's very interesting, she only told Helen about this when Helen was in her 50s. She was so ashamed of her past. I think it's, um, Annie understood how important education was for her. She managed to get out of Tewkesbury Arms House by um, one day a man called Frank Sanborn, who was the, uh, I think he was the Massachusetts commissioner. He came, to per he came to Tewkesbury and she knew about him and she knew about the School for the Blind, Perkins, and she jumped out, this is the myth, she jumped out of line and she said, dear sir, please, I want to go to school. And she succeeded. She managed to get herself taken out of Tewkesbury and sent to Perkins. Um, she was absolutely, she fervently understood that she had to be her own defender, that she absolutely had to stand up for herself, and in that same way, she had to stand up for her pupil. This is Helen and Annie. Actually, that's a, this is an image with Helen with a doll that was, re, it was actually refound not long ago, but caused a huge sensation. Um, Annie taught Helen the manual sign language. I'm not gonna go through this, the moment at the pump because you probably all know it, and that's, I wanna get way beyond that. So, but anyway, the manual sign language is the system whereby you finger spell words into another person's hand. And she gave Helen the means of communicating at the age of seven, and that was key. And not long after she gave her the means of communicating with um, the manual sign language, she, Helen was rapidly able to uh, write, which was extraordinary. Okay, this is another one. I said, this is text, I wanted to read this quote too. I shall talk into her hand as we talk into the baby's ears. I shall assume that she has the normal child's capacity of assimilation and imitation. I shall use complete sentences in talking to her. This sounds very obvious to us in many ways, but this was revolutionary at the time. She was friends with Maria Montessori, and Maria Montessori was a huge fan of Annie's. And, uh, okay, so let's have a look at her handwriting. So, this is June 20th, 1887. So this is seven days before Helen's seventh birthday. And this little girl is only six years of age. Annie has arrived in Tuscumbia in March. Think about it. And only in April did we have the water pump moment. And this is June. So the teacher and the pupil have gone from understanding that everything has a name to actually writing. Okay, and so you have these words, cat, cat, cold, cold, catch, catch. Both these things are in the gallery and you can look at them. 
And it really is mind blowing. And I've been doing this for many years now, and it's still mind blowing, right? And then you go for like two and a half years later, you have her writing in this beautiful square block script. The way I understand it from what I've read, when Helen has explained what she's, uh, how she's written, she had a ruler under, uh, a, a ruler, and then she'd have a pencil, and then she'd um, write these square letters using her finger to create the spaces between the letters. But this is very cute. She writes, I study about, this is 1889, I study about the earth and the animals, and I like arithmetic exceedingly. I learn many new words too. Exceedingly is one that I learned yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so she gets right in there. That's my Helen. Okay. And also, she taught Helen the system of Todoma. Actually, you saw it in the clip. In, did you see that Helen had her hand? Oh, right. Maybe many of you already know what Todoma is. I bet you do. Okay. Skip that. Next. <laughs> it's, 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 but it's amazing that she managed to teach this child um, how to communicate with her hand on the nose and the larynx, it's, it's amazing. Um, she insisted on bringing Helen to Perkins, uh, not just for the educational purposes, but to meet philanthropists, as I told you. Helen was a sponge for knowledge and information, and she fervently wanted to go to college. I mean, Annie wasn't pushing Helen to go to college, Helen wanted to go to college, and she did. And this is Helen's um, acceptance certificate to Radcliffe College, 1900. Women were entering universities in far greater numbers at the turn of the 20th century, and um, Helen was accepted to Radcliffe, the sister college to Harvard in 1900. Helen was the first deafblind person to enter a university, and she was a woman to boot. You've got to remember, so how did she sit there in the classes, right? Annie manually signed all the lectures to Helen. So you've got to think, not just manually signed a lecture, then you have to read and you do your homework. So any books that were not braille, because not everything was braille, Annie, bra um, Annie manually signed those braille, you know, if they, if they weren't braille, Annie manually signed that text to Helen. Um, and I think Helen's success was in no small measure, obviously attributable to Annie, but in attributable to the incredible education that this young girl had. She, I mean, many of you probably know, but, she read French, German, she understood Greek and Latin. I have, we have the papers in the archive, her earliest essays, they're also at Perkins, and they are really exceptional, it's just incredible. And she knew she wanted the same for others. She wasn't just absorbing this information, she was giving back, that was all that, Helen was always about, I know this, I can do this, now it's my turn to give back, and this, is what she said, and she wrote a lot, and this is one thing she wrote. It is to college graduates that this nation has a right to look for intelligent sons and daughters who will return to the state tenfold what the state has given to them. People say, why do you attempt what no one else has ventured? You are most foolhardy to attempt something in which you are sure to fail. Thus counsel the unadventurous people to whom the untrodden field is full of traps and pitfalls. That's my Helen. And, moreover, she continued to push for education, for especially if for those who could not see. This is a wonderful letter that Ruth Pratt, a congresswoman, wrote to Helen in 1931. This is a very important moment. This is the pratt Smoot bill that demanded the distribution of books in Braille to adults with vision loss. Helen went to the Library of Congress. She went to, um, she went to Congress and she spoke before Congress. She did this many times throughout her life to different um, legislatures. As a result of her appearing in front of um, this Congress, the bill was passed and books were distributed in Braille to, the, to adults with vision loss. And this, the, I, just want to, I just want to transcribe the annotation at the bottom by Ruth Pratt. It writes, she writes, I wish you might have heard the many tributes paid you while the bill was under consideration on the floor of the house. She was very charismatic. People often told me, you know, actually the very few people who I've heard have actually met her, that she was, uh, she had this aura. She really, she had a profound effect on a room. And I want you to see, there's a beautiful image of Helen reading Braille. She has lovely hands. And she wrote, she wrote this. Books are the eyes of the blind. They reveal to us the glories of the light-filled world. They keep us in touch with what people are thinking and doing. They help us to forget our limitations. 
With our hands plunged into, into an interesting book, we feel independent and happy. This is uh, Blazing the Trail. Does the modern girl think for herself? Okay. This is a classic 1930s article. Helen wrote many, many articles in the Home magazine. She was writing to a population that was struggling in the middle of the Great Depression. Her articles provided uplift and messages of support. They were clash, classic Depression era articles, um, sort of to you know bring up a weary citizenry. They encouraged the pursuit of knowledge as well as self-reliance and concern for the welfare of others. I'm going to give you a few of those, those titles. Know thyself. The importance of reading. Is marriage the highest fulfillment of a girl's life? <laughs> Love ye one another. The voice of humanity. Christmas Day is Children's Day. So you get the general idea, okay? So, here we go. Does the modern girl think for herself? Why should women make of themselves caricatures of men? If they would only cultivate their own individualities, how much more useful they would be and how much happier? She was very, you know, forthright. She was a feminist and she really pushed women to stand up and do their thing. But above all this, what you can also notice in these articles when you read them more carefully is actually they have many religious overtones. And I think what's often neglected about Helen, and I think it's a shame because it's a very important part of her, is that she was very religious. She had a very, very strong faith. She was something called a Swedenborgian, which I'd never heard of before I came here. Um, but apparently it's a Christian, not cult, but it's like a small group of Christian religious belief. Um, there was a man called Emanuel Swedenborg from Sweden, from the 18th century, and he believed that this world is a very pale reflection of the next. Um, but one of the most important things about um, his ideas was the importance of um, helping society, to put your money where your mouth was, so far as helping others and the welfare of all. And um, she really did this. And you can see here the text she's writing, this is beautiful hand, and you, that, this image is blown up in the gallery. Mm. Faith is the strength by which a shattered world shall emerge into the light. Mm. And I, I found this not long ago, which I thought was worth reading to you. It is not more relief that is needed, so much as more education and more preventive measures. It is up to women to try to understand why there is so much preventable wretchedness and find, method, find methods of preventing it. Yet again, she's pushing for women to stand up and be counted and, and assist. This is 1931, okay, that she wrote this. Helen had been writing for decades already, okay? And as many of you probably already know, her most famous book was The Story of My Life. She wrote this in 1902. I put this next to other copies, um, um, other translations. But, um, I think this one's Italian. And honestly, I can't remember. One of them's Hindi, I believe. I can't remember what they were. I think the other one is an Asian language, but I'm not sure. But uh, uh, she published it when she was 21 years of age, and it still it goes into print. And uh, she wrote in total 14 books and over 475 articles. Um, the editor and assistant on the story of my life was a man called John Albert Macy, and he features a lot. He was a lecturer at Harvard. He was the associate editor of the Youth's Companion. Most importantly, from the perspective of the story and Helen's uh, future, was that he was not only was he an up-and-coming literary critic, he also had very strong socialist views. This leads us to politics. And by the way, just the, my religion, midstream, optimism, I believe, I can't remember what that was, I think that's teacher, actually. Oh, that's about Anne Sullivan Macy, that's the um, biography that she wrote of Annie. So, politics. And here we have Helen and John Macy and Annie Sullivan, which is in Redford, Massachusetts. Helen graduated Radcliffe in 1904. Soon after this, Helen and Annie purchased a farm and land in Rentham. And you've got to think these two women are purchasing this farm and this home of, with their own money. Um, John and Annie were romantically involved. Um, they married in 1905, but then they separated in 1914. Oh, no. I know. John Macy... <laughs> John Macy uh, provided huge intellectual stimulation for Helen. He was very, very important. And connection to left-wing radicals. 
And here we have Helen's Socialist Party cards. Yes. And they're glorious with their stamps. And you can <laughs> see them outside, beautiful red things. Um, okay. She knew she was going to get flack from the media if she announced that she'd become a socialist because she, previously to this she'd been writing books about optimism and you know, all sort of happy things. Whereas if socialism was politics, it was much more hardcore. Um, so she held off from telling the media until 1910. Helen of Bubble supported equal pay for equal work for women. And our archival collection is a who's who of leading socialists, anarchists, and communists. Mm. We have Eugene Debs, who was the union organizer and the Socialist Party presidential candidate, Max Eastman, the famous writer, Emma Goldman, the anarchist, Fred Warren, the editor of Appeal to Reason, and many other radicals. Helen spoke at public meetings. She addressed published, um, she, create, she wrote pu articles for, um, for newspapers. Above all, she said that the financial disparity between classes not only disenfranchised large portions of American society, but was eroding America's democratic principles and the health of the nation as a whole. She was like, she was like, this is classic teen. She was, she was in the right place at the right time. This is when you could be a, a flaming socialist was in the teens, right? So this was perfect. But unfortunately, by 1912, there was so much in, in fighting in the Socialist Party that she actually decided to leave the Socialist Party. She was disillusioned with the um, party's support of the US entry into World War I. She was a pacifist. She, she was absolutely opposed to US involvement in the war. So by 1924, she had joined the Progressive Party, um, led by, I believe, Robert La Follette. She became one of his fighting bobs. Um, La Follette was a Wisconsin senator and US presidential nominee. She wrote, interestingly, she wrote that she was concerned that visible support for La Follette um, would result in him being lambasted by political opponents. You've got to think about it. You also always have to remember, she is by this time, what, 44. So she's famous and 44. She has clout at this point, okay? Here's what she wrote. I have hesitated to write to you because I know that the newspaper opposed to the progressive movement will cry out at the pathetic exploitation <laughs> of deaf and blind Helen Keller by the motley elements who support <laughs> La Follette. It would be difficult to imagine anything more fatuous and stupid than the attitude of the press toward anything I say on public affairs. So long as I confine my activities to social service and the blind, they compliment me extravagantly, call me arch priestess of the Cyprus, wonder woman, and a modern miracle. But when it comes to discussion of poverty, that is a different matter. Yeah. So we can read and we can see how, how hard it was for Helen to be taken seriously as a political activist. Um, yet again, she was still a woman. Um, she was still a woman. That was the problem. Okay, here we have Henry Ford and Helen Keller. I want it to be clear that as much as she corresponded and her friends, most of her friends were left wing, she knew tons of people who were entrepreneurs, who were you know, capitalists, and this is just one example. And our, um, the correspondence in the archive reflects that. We have Carnegie in there, we have Rockefellers, we have the whole nine yards. And here we have Mr. Andrew Carnegie. This is funny, I have to tell you this story. She describes going to tea in 1913 at Carnegie's house. He'd offered her an annuity in the past, but she proudly refused it. But she realized she needed, she, it was hard. She was earning her money as a lecturer. She was in vaudeville. She couldn't get by that way, so she needed help. And this is what she wrote in her book called Midstream about the meeting that they had at tea. She accepted the money. <laughs> he told me again that the annuity was mine whenever I would take it and asked me if it was true that I had become a socialist. When I admitted that it was true, he found many disparaging things to say about socialists and even threatened to take me across his knees and spank me if I did not come to my senses. <laughs> All right. This is funny, but it also has an element of condescension and sexism to my modern yeah. ear. That's the problem. It's hardly the words of a modern woman, right? Does that, you know, that's kind of, hmm. But she knew she had to, what she had to do. She needed this money, and to some extent, that, well, to what extent do we really, we don't compromise what we have to do, but we, there's a balancing act to eat today for all of us to, you know, we have to get by to what, what do we give and what do we not give. Helen knew that she needed this financial assistance and she took it, but it's a bit, uh, 
So how, how could she retain her political integrity and philosophical integrity by hanging out with the left and taking money from the right, essentially, is what she was doing to many, in many ways. But she managed it. Because remember, 1913, when she was, um, she was already 33 years of age, and as I, as I said before, she was famous. And she leveraged her fame, and um, her disability had enabled her to enter the political day, d debate, but it had also opened her up to criticism. It's quite a double-edged sword, in a way. You could, she could use her disability in some ways to get into the media, but then she could be accused of not being fully able to argue a point or not, not being fully there. It, it's, a, it's really it's a dodgy place to be. But we will move on to women's rights. Hmm. Here we go. And this is the Retail Clerks International Advocate. This, this actually, this is out in the gallery. And here, um, it comes as no surprise, most importantly, that Helen was a suffragist. She spoke out strongly in favor of votes for women and equal pay for equal work for women. And she writes, I hope the association will not cease its efforts until every woman who toils for her bread shall receive a living wage and be protected from the poverty which enslaves. And here, this is a speech to delegates of the New Woman's Party in Chicago, 1916. As I'm sure you all know, four years later, women got the vote, so women actually could not vote at this time, okay? And she writes here, the same wiseacres who argue against woman's suffrage argued against higher education for women 60 years ago. They solemnly asserted that education would unfit women to be wives and mothers, and they hinted at the possible extermination of the race. They insisted that the majority of women were content with their lot in life. Only a few strong-minded women wanted to go to college. Today, they declare that women do not really want the vote, but only a few mannish women are clamoring for suffrage. <laughs> Such arguments are always used to resist the march of progress. And that's how I'm... Female emancipation was inextricably linked to class and the ability to earn a living wage. As long as the rich and corporate bosses were allowed to run the affairs of state, women would be denied the right to vote, as it was against the interest of the ruling classes for women to have access to power. And just to give you historical context, this is Grover Cleveland. Helen met Grover Cleveland when she was a little girl, but I don't think he expected her to do quite all the things that she did. Um, in 1905, he wrote that the female voting would upset a natural equilibrium so nicely adjusted to the attributes and limitations of both men and women that it cannot be disturbed without social confusion and peril. This gives you an idea, right? 1905, 1916, it gives you a context. What Helen was doing really was radical, right? So it's easy to forget all this, but by seeing what leading men said, hopefully we can see it a little more clearly. And I love this, I just had to put it in. Work is flapper's real need, says Helen Keller. Modern girl isn't bad, just restless, blind genius declares. Give her freedom and sympathy, and she will make the world proud of her. And in fact, I found this just last week. This is exactly what I was trying to say. This is what Helen then replies. The public must learn, well, I had said previously, must learn that the blind man is neither a genius, nor a freak, nor an idiot. He has a mind which can be educated, a hand which can be trained, ambitions which it is right for him to strive to realize, and it is the duty of the public to help him make the best of himself so that we can win light through work. That says it clearly. She's not a mythic character. She's not a genius. She's just a woman who's very smart, who works extremely hard, right? There's a reason I've got these two up here. This is a 1900 image and a 1917 image, both mothers with their babies. This is sort of middle to upper middle class mother with her baby. And this is a lady in uh, New York City. I'm guessing, I think she's from the Tenements, okay? Um, different social classes. Helen was a powerful advocate for poor women from the Tenements. She spoke out on taboo subjects. The first of which was, some, was a disease called ophthalmoneonatorum, and the second was birth control. I'm gonna deal with ophthalmoneonatorum first. Um, ophthalmia neonatorum was a sexually transmitted disease that left newborn babies blind. It was caused by syphilis and gonorrhea. It was a highly treatable venereal disease that pregnant women passed on to their babies at the time of birth. The remedy was to place silver nitrate drops in the newborn infant's eyes. In 1909, at least two-fifths of all blindness in the United States was attributable to the disease. 
what's very interesting is our archival collection has material dating from 1907 until 1953 on the subject in the Helen Keller collection to give you an idea of the longevity of her interest and concern with this topic and how much she was involved. Um, Helen corresponded with doctors, politicians, and health and blindness organizations on the issue. Um, the clip reflects her ability to be heard when others failed. Many doctors could not get their articles published because it was too taboo a subject. But Helen managed to do that, and she used her voice to do that. Uh, in 1909, she'd written um, three years uh, previously. She'd written in the Ladies' Home Journal, that's it. This is 1909. It is always painful to set oneself against tradition, especially against the conventions and prejudices that hedge about womanhood. False delicacy and prudery must give place to precise information and common sense. You'll see in the articles, she goes on and on about how I know, I know, I'm, I'm going to talk about something that no one wants to hear about or we shouldn't be talking about in public, but, and then she doesn't only just say that, she lays out the disease itself. Um, she explained that most women contracted the disease from their husbands who, in quote, cohabited with prostitutes. This was very, you know, this was quite radical for the time. And it's also classic Helen Keller. She demands we, we deal with a problem head on. Knowledge is the key to an enlightened society. Don't sweep uncomfortable topics under the carpet. We can make things better. And here is a letter to the New York Court, which was a very left-wing magazine, a newspaper, in defense of Emma Goldman. This letter is outside in the uh, vitrine. Um, in it, she's defending Goldman, who's about to be incarcerated for distributing leaflets on birth control to women in the tenements. And she writes um, to the newspaper um, to say, please don't jail this woman. And this is what she writes. Women of the upper classes, remember we've got those two different images of women. Uh, women of the upper classes know about these contracepts and use them. The difference between the birth rates of Riverside Drive and the Lower East Side proves this. Does anyone suppose the infrequency of the stork's visits among them is caused by the superior moral restraint of the well-to-do? It is part of the conscious and diabolical purpose of the masters to prevent any falling off in the supply of wage slaves. Okay? She doesn't miss a beat. And her other very, the woman that she had a very good friendship with and who she admired immensely was Margaret Sanger. All right, and in 1952, I'm just going to go straight to what she writes because it sort of speaks for itself. This is 1952, years later, decades. What a glow of gratification was kindled in my heart when Polly read last week the wonderful news that you had founded the Planned Parenthood Association in India. As you teach, mankind has through ignorance often destroyed the sweet joy of childhood. Now a tide of enlightenment, slow but sure, shall lift its healing waves from one end of the world to the other until every child has a chance to be well-born, well-fed, and fairly started in life. Affectionately, I salute you, Margaret Sanger, as the prophet and the woman Prometheus of humanity's highest physical and mental welfare. Helen Keller. All right, so I think we can fairly well say she was a modern woman in the women right, <laughs> women's rights department. And that's quite clear. All right, changing the perception of blindness. So here, this is Helen at home in Forest Hill. She's typing. She always did her own typing. Annie never did the typing. Helen did all the typing. Yeah. yeah. And Helen joined the American Foundation for the Blind in 1924 and remained at AFB until she died in 1968. AFB was founded in 1921, three years earlier. AFB and its president, MC Miguel, had approached Helen to become a fundraiser. AFB offered her an outlet for her passion as an advocate and provided her with the financial stability and legitimacy she needed. That was huge. Helen offered AFB enormous star power. Mm. And here is Helen and Annie. This is 1930. Um, by 1927, Anne and Helen had addressed 250,000 people at 249 meetings in 123 cities. The campaign was not a fundraising success, fundraising success but it was a fabulous public relations success. She brought the issue of, in fact, they brought the issue of blindness to the awareness of more Americans across the country than at any time before. The women were invaluable to the organization, and um, they knew it, and so did MC Miguel. However, their relationship was not always smooth. Um, Annie would often argue about money with AFB, um, but after a rocky start to the relationship, things eventually mellowed and it was, did become one of mutual respect. And um, 
Miguel famously dubbed them the Three Musketeers because, let me also explain, Annie died in 1936. Um, in 1914, um, Polly Thompson, a Scottish woman, had joined the Helen Keller household and had also manually signed very well at this point and took over from um, Annie when Annie died. So when you see images later on, they're going to be of Polly because Annie had died. All right. Most importantly, I guess, in many ways, from the perspective of blindness, which is huge, is that Helen was an enormously successful lobbyist. From the 1920s to the 1940s, she traveled and wrote to at least um, 18 state legislatures. She personally appeared in front of at least 13. This is the part that people don't write about Helen, that really, this is what I really want to push, that she absolutely changed the face of disability. She absolutely did. It's not the water pump Helen at all. State commissions for the blind were created, re rehabilitation centers were funded, and education was made accessible to those with vision loss. And this is classic Helen. She put, appeared in front of the legis legislature of Iowa. And this is a portion of the text. You are asked to appropriate $25,000 to carry on the work for two years. That means about $12,000 a year. Gentlemen, that is not enough. You should double it. Please remember, there are 2,000 blind people in the state, the majority of whom can, through training and special aid, become self-supporting citizens. It seems to me the civilization of the state should be measured by the amount of suffering it prevents and the degree of happiness it makes possible for its citizens. Not much has really changed, has it, in many ways, the bottom line. Okay, Helen tugged on people's heartstrings, but this was not a straightforward um, ask for charity. She demanded money so that those with vision loss could help themselves. So Self-sufficiency was the goal, not a handout, and that was very important. Here is a letter um, from Helen to FDR. As many of you probably already, actually let me backtrack. Helen knew 10 US presidents. She knew, uh, no sorry, 10 US presidents are represented in the archive. Helen knew every US president from Grover Cleveland to LBJ, to Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, in 1934, she convinced President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was a personal fan of hers, to release funding for the Talking Book Program as a depression era Works Progress Administration Project. The talking book was the result of her writing. And the talking book opened up avenues to knowledge and books that were previously inaccessible to those who had not mastered Braille. Helen could read Braille. Many people with vision loss could not read Braille. Okay, so the audio book helped those who could not um, see. And she writes, it is wonderful. With a stroke of the pen, you have released the blessing of the talking book the most constructive aid to the blind since, blind since the invention of Braille, which opened to them the doors of education. Okay. And here, I just love this piece, so I put it in. Um, she, um, it's a letter from a US Army colonel to Helen on her visit in 1944. Helen, one of Helen's personal favorite things that she did, which she was most proud of, was visiting veterans. And when you, when you go into the archive and you see this list of her, her schedule of all the different uh, military hospitals she visited, there's a ton of them, absolutely loads of them. And she really, you know, she really had a radical effect on those she, she uh, met. And the colonel writes, you have no idea the effect your visit to the gymnasium made. A number of, a number of the double amputees, after seeing and hearing Helen, remarked, we have no worries now. The impression that Helen gave that she was the one who was gaining strength and comfort by visiting with the patients made a profound impression on all of us. And the images are really amazing in the archive. And I had to put this in. This is a beautiful, this is a beautiful image of Helen with um, uh, veterans. And this is classic Helen. I long to accomplish a great and noble task. But it is my chief duty to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. The world is moved along not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes, but also by the aggregate of the tiny pushes of each honest worker. That is what she did, left foot, right foot, day in, day out. She just, and I think it really was a result also of her faith. She had this extraordinary inner faith that what she was doing was important and meant something. And then she really got extravagant. She's <laughs> traveled all over the world. She went to 39 countries around the world. This is Helen arriving in Mumbai in India in 1951. She is... Hold on. She is, I probably can see she's here with Polly. So there they are. This is a great shot. Um, 
her innate skill as an advocate is clearly seen in her international travels. From the 1930s to the 1950s, she realized her goal of taking advocacy for those with vision loss around the globe. What's good to remember, this is the 1940s and 50s. She was in her 60s and 70s. The Cold War was you know, really getting going. Most women were relegated to the kitchen. There was Helen, deaf, blind, former socialist, getting on in years, a woman, and crisscrossing the globe, okay? So she was not the typical female. And here she is with Nehru. And here she is with Churchill. She could criticize where others could not. And this is Helen in Nara in Japan, 1948. What I don't have is an image of Helen in 1937 in Japan, which is when she first went to Japan. And then she was allowed to, uh, the, uh, the first woman to ever be allowed to touch the um, statue, the great Buddha statue. So that was a huge honor. That was a big, big deal. Um, and here we have a gifts. These are examples of things in the archives. These are gifts, and they're beautiful. And here I want you to see, to get a sense of her effect in Japan, is the film footage. For the first time since before the war, Helen Keller pays a visit to the people of Japan. This time as a guest of the United States government. In Tokyo and other cities, the entire population turns out to cheer this great American, left blind and deaf by an affliction. To the Japanese people, Miss Keller's life is an inspiring example of what hope and determination can do. For she has conquered inconceivable darkness and isolation to become a world figure. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still recovering from the atomic bomb when Helen Keller went there on pilgrimage. Shrines, the Japanese created an everlasting shrine to the memory of the great teacher, Anne Sullivan. Helen lighted the first candle. The people of Japan will see that the light never goes out. She was sent by General Douglas MacArthur to Japan. The Japanese people are still crazy about her. Many of my scholars are Japanese. Up to two million people came out to see her. She was, she was a huge, huge deal. Um, here she is speaking in, in front of a crowd. She traveled to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, she wrote the following about her visit to Hiroshima. Because remember, she was still trying to raise funds whilst she was doing all this traveling. It was to these people that I made the appeal, yet despite the consummate barbarity of some military forces of my country and the painful wreckage upon the survivors, they listened quietly to what I had to say. Their affectionate welcome from the moment I arrived until two hours later when we left by ferry for Miyajima will remain in my soul a holy memory and a reproach. Um, so the question arises, to what extent was she maybe a tool of the US propaganda machine? Because she was so, you know, she was a huge, huge success. And America was frightened of communism coming down from China. And she was just this wonderful example of an American. But I think she managed to walk the line. And I think I really have read quite a lot. And I, I think she was above the political fray. She went and traveled and spoke about blindness. She was focused on the blind community. It's, it's a difficult line to, to walk, but she, she absolutely, I don't think she was at all. Of, um, her own left-wing politics obviously were probably very different to those of General Douglas MacArthur, but she really managed to do her job, I think, well. And yet again, she, when she traveled to South Africa, she had the, the difficulty of remaining quiet about apartheid. But, and she did try and speak up and did try and criticize the government, but she did it, you know, she was actually got a lot of flack for doing even what she did say. Um, but yet again, she thought it was more important to meet with all the different groups of people in society to speak rather than not to speak at all. And for those, um, especially, um, um, black Africans to actually be able to get help and get medical care if they needed it. Okay, so this is life without faith is uneasy, timorous, and wholly spent in running away from misfortunes, which are in the nature of things inescapable. So she understood that she couldn't fix everything and she couldn't always, 
you know, do the right thing. But she didn't think that just by not taking a part was the answer. She had to sort of get in there. A modern woman, so you can clearly see her public, as a public life, she was definitely a modern woman. But a modern woman also has a life off stage and not just in the limelight. What about the domestic life of Helen Keller? What about her household? What about love and her privately held thoughts? private life, public persona. This is Helen at our home in Westport, Connecticut, Arkin Ridge, and that desk is the desk out in the gallery. Um, Helen's private thoughts are elusive. Her early correspondence was lost in a fire at her home in Connecticut in 1946. Um, the existing correspondence to her close friends from the 1950s revolves around the cultural events she attended, politics, and the kindness of others towards her. This is Helen in 19, uh, 1918, two years after she'd had an affair with a man called Peter Fagan. She tried and failed to elope with Peter Fagan. He was a young writer and secretarial assistant who learned the manual sign language to be able to talk to Helen and translate texts to her. Helen lived with Annie in Wentham and her, with her mother as well and um, often stayed in the house. Helen kept the affair a secret from both her mother and Annie up until the attempted elopement hit the newspapers. And then interestingly, she fiercely denied the affair to both her mother and her teacher. She felt guilty for having lied to her mother and Annie. And here, do you remember, do you remember John Macy, the husband? Okay, the, well, former husband. Uh, what, a, like a few months ago, I was very happy because I received a cache of letters, a copies of letters that I'd never seen before. And they're photocopies, but I'm still very happy to have read them. They are letters from John to Helen. And one of them was written in 1917, the year after the failed elopement. And it's, it's John to Helen, and you can tell by the letter that obviously she, she felt guilty and he was trying to alleviate her sense of guilt. But maybe we can have a better understanding of Helen from his reply, maybe just a little bit. So here we go. You speak of a confession and of a blot on your life. It is no crime to love a man as for lying, no fellow in love, unless he is a fool, ever tells the truth, especially to old people whose fires are burned out. I have often thought of you with a child fathered by a fairly sound and decent man. A woman is not complete until she has been loved. That's a biological fact and there is no getting round it. But here is another fact, physiological and psychological, that the vitality of an unmated woman finds outlet in other ways which are good for her and for other people, especially if she has a fine intelligence to work with, as you have. Okay. But that still leaves us. There's Kate and Annie and Helen. Helen was, was 36 years of age. She wasn't 18 when she did not elope with um, this young man. She could have ignored her mother and teacher, or was she inextricably linked to them? What you've also got to think about, the common belief at the time was that it was unwise for a deafblind woman to marry and have children. Did she subscribe to that theory? And I wonder to what. On some level, I can't help but think that she almost took in the sense that her disability was a barrier to a traditional personal life or in some ways inaccessible to her. I, I'm totally, that's my take on this, but I do have that sense. And it's sort of ironic because she was so vocal in urging others to go and do their thing, right? But that's as it is. But she obviously had a full and happy life. Here she is at her typewriter in the 1950s. I love that shot. That's actually not a typewriter, sorry, it's a braille writer. And we have that in the archive. What earthly consolation is there for one like me whom fate has denied a husband and the joy of motherhood? At the moment, my lo Annie has just died, okay, sorry. At the moment, my loneliness seems a void that will all, always be immense. Fortunately, I have much work to do, more than ever before, in fact. She's echoing what John had said decades earlier, that she will be able to do something and do a lot with her life. But it's an important thing. She's a real woman of flesh and blood. She just didn't work all day long. She was sad about some things, you know. So we're moving right along. Let's move it along. Here's Helen, AFB, in 1950. AFB's headquarters. Um, she spent a lifetime working and using her intelligence to make the world a better place. This is sort of summary. At this point, she was in the captain's seat, but she'd already worked in a variety of jobs over many decades. Mobility is very much the mark of a modern woman, and Helen had that mobility. So, she, I don't know if many of you know, but in, in uh, the 20s, she was in vaudeville. So you go from vaudeville, lecture circuit, you, there she is decades later in Mexico. I love that image. 
Since I was 17, I have managed my own life. At the age of 22, I began working very hard for whatever money I had earned during the past 34 years. Helen was the main breadwinner of her house since the 1920s. Um, she and AFB's leadership had not always seen eye to eye, but they had mutual goals. Advocacy for those with vision loss and the right for those um, with impaired vision to have the same advantages in life as their seeing counterparts was everything she fought for. Helen had a stroke in 1960. This resulted in her work schedule slowing down. She remained at Arkham Ridge more and more. Um, by the time she died in 1968, she'd worked for AFB for over 40 years, as Carl told us. So to wrap up, I love this shot. It's a color shot of Helen at Arkham Ridge with her dog. She had dogs her whole life. She did not have um, dog guides. She had pet and dogs as pets, and she didn't have a cane. In fact, we'll talk about that in a minute. Hold on. Um, I think she is very much in the camp of modern woman. Um, she was a woman who battled for political and social change for women and for those with vision loss years before others were taking up the gauntlet. She had a varied career, she ran her household, she traveled the world. Although she didn't marry, she had lifelong companions with Annie and Polly. She had very strong friendships. Her faith demanded respect for all. She wrote and spoke about all world religions with equal respect. Um, my gut reaction on what makes Helen modern was her ability and success in directing her life as she wanted to. She profoundly believed in freedom, the freedom for herself and others to lead full and happy lives, regardless of disability, gender, or ethnicity. And when we say those three things today, we hear them all the time, you know, they weren't saying those things back in, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, she always spoke about out against, uh, for freedom. I always finish my tour reading this letter, and I'm gonna do that sort of now. It's a text, Helen's book was burnt by the Nazis in 1933 as part of the book burning. And um, this was her response, an open letter to the student body of Germany. History has taught you nothing if you think you can kill ideas. Tyrants have tried to do that often before, and the ideas have risen up in their might and destroyed them. You can burn my books and the books of the best minds in Europe, but the ideas in them have seeped through a million channels and will continue to quicken other minds. I gave all the royalties of my books for all time to the soldiers blind in the World War with no thought in my heart but love and compassion for the German people. Do not imagine your barbarities to the Jews are unknown here. God sleepeth not and he will visit his judgment upon you. Better were it for you to have a millstone hung round your neck and sink into the sea than to be hated and despised of all men. Mm -hmm. That's 1933. She was 52, she lived another 35 years and, can, and continued to be vocal um, for free speech. She profoundly believed that humanity is the capacity to improve itself and make the world a better place. And I love this shot, so I used it. Aww. This is Helen, color shot, 1961, Ooh. Martha's Vineyard. She's fearless in her life. She was a risk taker. She was willing to publicly disagree and take a position that was not necessarily the popular or convenient one. She did not see barriers only possibilities, never bend your head, always hold it high, look the world straight in the face. Happy birthday, Helen Keller.